This is now the fourth homily in a homiletic series on marriage. Last week, the homily was entitled Reaching at Last Together the Fullness of Years, which comes directly out of the nuptial blessing which is imparted upon man and woman immediately before they're united in holy matrimony after having given their consent. And is it not the case that all marriages in fledgling state or all engaged couples preparing themselves for marriage, do they not hope to reach at last together the fullness of years, not just in length, but in quality of years together? To grow old and wonderfully wrinkly together and to not care about the wrinkles. Last week in the homily, I mentioned four bumps that can happen along the way, some of the most common bumps in holy matrimony. Criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and since I don't have that memory loaded in my, that homily loaded in my head right now, I don't remember the fourth one. However, if your inclination, as I went through those, was to say, yeah, my spouse does that, then today's gospel is for you. Who are you having a beam in your own eye sticking right out that you can smack people around with it? Who are you to notice the splinter in your brother's or your spouse's eye? You see, you and I are people who love to do ocular surgery on other people without giving any moment's notice or pause for reflection to our own blindness. So easy is it for each one of us to say, the problem with this world, the problem with this family, the problem with this marriage, the problem with this parish, the problem with whatever, is any which direction a sprinkler will throw water. But not this way. So easy is it to say, because of these circumstances happening in my life, I can't live up to my marriage. In my first year of seminary at St. John Vianney, we go on a 30-day silent retreat. And this silent retreat is geared towards, one, our detachment from worldly things, and two, our ability to see all things of the world, all created things, as pointing to Creator. And then to have the freedom of heart, the flexibility of our choices, to be able to, in all things, prefer the will of God, to prefer the Creator to the created. The first paragraph of these spiritual exercises was written in the 1540s by a Spanish soldier, St. Ignatius. And the first part of the spiritual exercises begins like this. Man, mankind, is created to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by this means, to save his soul. Which is to say, if he chooses to praise, reverence, and serve something else, his television, his 401k, his ladder climbing in his career, that he will seek that as an end, and he will receive that for eternity, and it will become for him hell. But for those who prefer the Creator to the created, they shall have their desire. Man is created to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by this means to save his soul. All of the other things in the face of this earth stand in relation to that end. 
the end of his salvation, and the end of the praise, reverence, and serving of God. This they do at the end of the beginning of seminary, the last part of the first year of seminary, so as to help us see everything from our grades to the way that that people treat us in public. Sometimes we're praised, sometimes people palm us a 20, sometimes we get spit on in the collar in public. To see none of these things as affecting me and my vocation, but as mere circumstances in which God is still present. To not judge my vocation, my seeking of holiness, my self-gift to my bride, the Church of Northern Colorado. To not depend my judgments on how things are going, but on my fidelity to my vocation. If I were to show up in coffee and donuts and ask you if you consider your marriage successful, what would you say? Aside from that being a very awkward question, probably 92% of you would nervously shake your head yes and hope I don't ask a second question. But for real, if I ask if your marriage is successful, what are some of the criteria, or what is one criterion that you would have by which to judge whether your marriage is successful or not? Is it your happiness? Is it your level of stress? Is it your dual income? What a funny question. When man and woman come in on the day of their marriage, they stand before each other and before their dearly beloved community. And they recite these vows to each other. I, man... Take you, woman, their names are inserted there, to be my wife. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love you and honor you all of the days of your life. The success of your marriage has nothing to do with your riches, or your health, or your good times, but rather has everything to do with your choosing to love and to honor your spouse, above your pleasure, above sometimes even some of your needs. To love and honor him or her for as long as you have breath. About four to five times a week I get called to the hospital to anoint people on their deathbed, before or after a major surgery. Sickness and adversity is a great separator of good marriages from bad marriages. I can walk in a room and generally within 15 seconds tell the general tone of the marriage. From body, con- uh, body language, eye contact, not so much with me, but with each other. A general freedom of relationality in between them, even in the presence of the priest. And yeah, I know I make people nervous. But strong marriages that are literally hell-bent on loving and honoring each other succumb to very few, if not any, circumstances. 
that it is not the condition of your bank account, nor your employment, nor your tax, tax situation, nor the TVs in your house, nor how entertained you are each week, nor whether or not you're able to take an international vacation every year, nor whether you have a Costco membership. None of these are measures or indicators of the success of marriage. Now, you and I are Catholic, and as I've said a couple of times, we don't do this cut, copy, and paste thing of marriage. When we say, I do, we do until death do us part. Now, there are circumstances that err from that ideal and that norm, and next week's homily is all about divorce and annulment. But for those for whom it is possible, and that is nearly everyone, the ideal of the fidelity of your marriage is the measure of its success. Your commitment to love and honor your spouse when he refuses to reciprocate it, when she becomes melodramatic, when family issues become involved, when the kids become far more burdensome than you ever thought they would on the day of your wedding. That there's no circumstance that will affect your choice to love and to honor. I am by no means a weightlifter. But my roommate is. You got that one. And Father Umberto, who loves to go to the gym at 2.30 a.m. in the morning, four days a week, probably as penance, but I don't know, (laughs) goes and lifts a bunch of weights with a bunch of other beef heads. And the way that you get muscle growth in the human body is by stressing it beyond its capacity. To lift weights and to target specific areas, specific muscle strands, and to actually create breakages of specific muscle fibers that push them beyond their individual capacity, but in concert with the whole, the function of that lifting of the weight is possible. And in fact, real hardcore muscle builders, clearly I don't know anything about that, Lift to the point of failure. And in lifting to the point of failure, they cause an undue stress. Breakages. In the muscle. And then what happens if the body has what it needs, enough protein, rest, and apparently branched-chain amino acids, when it has all that together, it actually becomes stronger. That after a point of failure, and after a point of breakage, if recovery is able to happen, then the whole of that chain of muscle can be made stronger. A number of people come to certain points of their marriages and they lose hope because they have come to a point of failure. A certain infidelity, be it major or minor, of the spouse. A certain failure, a certain breakage. And they refuse the all-necessary recovery for there to be increased strength. When there is a failure, we Americans love to use the phrase, I'm sorry. And we just slap it like a sticker and we walk away. I'm sorry, 
And what's the regular response to that? It's okay. Well, if there was apology needed in the first place, then it's not okay by definition. One step further in an apology is to say, I apologize for this, that, and the other thing. Sometimes there's a response, I accept. But even that is still a statement. And it leaves the apologizer in control, as opposed to recognizing that the apologizer is actually in debt. And in those two circumstances, real recovery is not super possible. Not to the fullest extent of strengthening a marriage. What I invite you to do, whether you're married or not, in all of your relationships, wherein you have an incurred a moral debt on someone through your own failure, through your own sin, through your own selfishness, is to use the phrase, will you forgive me? Honey, or honey baby sugar pie, whatever you call your spouse, will you forgive me for this and that and the effect of grief it has had on you? Will you forgive me for this action, my action, this cause, and its effects. That type of phraseology recognizes that you, the offender, are the debtor. And it actually gives the power and recovery of forgiveness, makes it possible in between the two. Because when she, or when he says, yes, I will, or I do forgive you, It mimics their vows when they said, I do. It puts the person in a place of vulnerability. Because instead of saying, I'm sorry, and then being able to walk away and go watch golf on a Sunday, he has to wait for a response. She has to wait with bated breath until he will release her. Until he will void the debt. And there can be true recovery which gives way to new strength. To say, I'm sorry, and to walk away, or to say, I'm sorry, and it's okay, is about as much conflict resolution as Jerry Springer can get through in one episode. And there's little resolution and almost no strengthening recovery. And yet, for those of you who work out your bodies, you know that there is no strength without that stress, without that breakage. And yet, if any of you are human, you know that to get through this life and to not fail is impossible. So to you in your marriages, there is good news that recovery and strength and grace is possible to you if we but change some of the postures of our heart. Satan will never, ever, ever tempt you towards two things. Satan will never tempt you towards true humility. Rather, if there's a breakage and it's your fault, he'll say, well, you were stressed. It was a tough week at work, right? Why don't you just couch yourself in a myriad of excuses so that there doesn't even need to be blame? Better yet, why don't you blame your spouse? Why don't you start with the phrase, you always? Because that'll go really well in a satanic argument. Satan will never tempt you towards humility because humility is honesty in the light of God. 
which means this. Those who condemn themselves, that's not humility either. That's pusillanimity, which is small-souledness, having a small soul. That's a different homily. But Satan will never tempt you towards true honesty of yourself in light of the love of Jesus, which is to say that you are incapable of perfection, this side of the grave, and by your own means. And that you depend on the love of someone who is stronger, whose love is salvific, and by whose love you have wed yourself in the sweet yoke of harmony of holy matrimony. That for you who sought to have your marriage blessed by the church and to have the grace of God imbue it, transform it, make strengthening recovery always possible by natural means of a well-articulated conversation and by supernatural means of grace and humility and prayer in the face of the obstinacy of your spouse, And your own seeking of success, not by way of your pleasure and stress-free, carefree family life, but by way of the success of your fidelity. That you will be faithful to your spouse even when he's not, even when she's incapable, even when it just doesn't seem like it's going to go your way. Satan will never tempt you to be humble. And to see your faults in the light of the love of Jesus and to accept his love and mercy. To go to confession, to not make it a big deal. To say, will you forgive me, honey baby sugar pie? And to do so in love and vulnerability. Satan will also never tempt you towards true fidelity, faithfulness. Satan realizes that some of you are well-formed enough or entrenched in enough Catholic guilt that you won't get divorced. But that's okay. He's cunning. It's still a victory of Satan if he can get you to cling on for just 20 more years of white-knuckling. Of just getting through filing your joint taxes, sharing a bed, or at least a house, and getting through and be able to send 20 bucks to the grandkids on their birthday. But to allow love and honor, which were the two pillars of the promise of your vows of holy matrimony, to wither and atrophy from within. But exteriorly, you get your house painted every five years and abide by the HOA, so it's fine, right? Satan's victory comes by attacking infidelity, if not from the outside by way of divorce, by way of inside, through the atrophy of love and honor. By somebody's unwillingness to enter into true forgiveness, to enter into true vulnerability, to communicate from the heart, to look at the spouse in the eyes for longer than 10 seconds, to dance, to take delight, to laugh, to go on a date, to have fun with the kids. Satan wins when our marriages are miserable, even if they stay together. Because as it says in the marriage vows, Christ abundantly blesses this marriage and all who seek him with true humility and fidelity. Immediately after exchanging vows, they exchange rings. Go ahead and fiddle with yours right now. They exchange rings and they say this. Saying the name of the other, they look them in the eye and grab their hand and say, so and so, receive this ring. I give it to you. 
Receive this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the couple, each calling upon the triune love of God, poured out from Father to Son, perfectly received and reciprocated from Son to Father, such that the love between them becomes its own person, the Holy Spirit. There you have the lover, the beloved, and the love between them, bound in inseparable, indivisible, eternal unity, and that is your call for all of eternity. You couples are to mirror the blessed life of the Trinity. Your call is that important. Your love is to be that secure, such that new life wells up from within the marriage. Children, progeny, but also grace, peace, life, hope, laughter, is to overflow from your home, diffusing far and wide the goodness of Christ to your neighbors and to those whom you meet. Receive this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity. That even in the moments when I don't live up to my promise to love and honor you, it is a symbol that I did promise it. And that I will seek recovery in the midst of our breakages, in the midst of my failures. This sign, which has become far too commercialized, and does not, is not imported by how many diamonds or what kind of rose gold is on it or the fact that he went to Jared. What is important is that it is given in love and called upon by the triune God to be a love that is lifted up beyond its own self-seeking self-satisfaction and that the success of that marriage and all marriages is measured by the fidelity of loving and honoring the other. It starts with being able to point to yourself wherein there is failure and it starts with the humble approach of the spouse from one to the other spouse, wherein there is failure, so that reconciliation and new life and mercy and peace may abound. Praise be Jesus Christ.